In the book of Numbers, we learn about the king of Moab and his desire to have the people of Israel cursed. This is one of two times in the Bible where we see a talking animal. The first, of course, is the serpent in the garden, and then this. It begins in Numbers 22, and the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side Jordan by Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. In the chapter before, Israel had captured the land of the Amorites, and so the king of Moab was, well, understandably worried. In fact, Moab was sore afraid of the people because there were so many. They were thought to number between two and a half to three million Israelites that had just been brought out of Egypt by Moses. And so Balak sent messengers to Balaam, asking him to come and to curse the people of Israel. Balaam was a false prophet hired by the king of Moab, and he was clearly a spiritually inclined person in conversation with gods, lowercase g, gods. We can understand this because Bilam was not surprised to hear from God when God asked him about the men he would travel with to curse the Israelites. When Bilam explained to God what was to be done, God clearly says, you cannot go with them and you cannot curse the people that are blessed, that I have blessed. Yet Bilam is offered more riches from the king of Moab, who is desperate to deal with the problem of these Israelites. Balaam clearly says that he can't go beyond the word of the Lord, his God, but Balaam, perhaps used to dealing with smaller gods, thinks he will ask God again to see if he can do something to help the king. Not altruistically, clearly for financial gain, but Balaam tries to negotiate with God again asking if he can go. This time God says, go if you will, but you say only what I allow you to say. So Balaam goes on his way. He's riding his donkey with two servants. And along the way, his donkey goes astray because the donkey could see an angel of the Lord standing in her way. Balaam could not see the angel and so enraged with the misbehaving donkey, he beats her. Two more times, the donkey would attempt to turn back from this imposing angel of the Lord. Two more times, Balaam would be enraged, even injured, and would beat her. And then the donkey spoke. The Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have beaten me three times? Balaam's eyes were opened by the Lord, and now he could see the angel. He could finally realize that the donkey was only responding to that angel and not misbehaving. The angel allowed Balaam to pass, but said that only the word that God put in his mouth could be spoken. Three times, Balak, the king of Moab, would bring Balaam to high places because those places were where the smaller gods were worshipped. Each time seven altars were built, seven oxen and seven rams were sacrificed. The first time on Kiriath Kusoth, Balaam says, How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? How shall I defy whom the Lord has not defied? The people, he continues, shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. While King Balak is pretty angry and troubled with this pronouncement, I took you to curse my enemies, and now you've blessed them. Let me take you to another place where you can see them, not all of them, but some of them. Almost like the king thought, only cursing some of the Israelites would be more palatable to Balaam. So the second place they went was Pisgah. Again, seven altars were built, seven oxen, seven rams sacrificed. Balaam 
with the words of the Lord says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? He has blessed, and I, Balaam, cannot reverse it. But the king of Moab was certain that this curse would just require one more try. Third time's a charm. So Balaam was brought to the top of Peor. And you guessed it, seven more altars, seven more oxen and rams sacrificed. But this third time, Balaam had the Spirit of God come to him, and he fell into a trance, saying, How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel, as the valleys are they spread forth, as gardens by the river's side, as the trees of ling aloes, which the Lord hath planted, and the cedar trees beside the waters. He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. King Balak was again angry with this pronouncement, but Balaam says he cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad of his own accord, no matter how much he is paid. Balaam continues and prophesied, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a shevet shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. He shall come that shall have dominion, and shall destroy him that remains in the city. Amalek, the Kenites, will perish. Asher will carry Moab away captive. Ships will come from the coast of Chittim, affecting Asher and Eber forever. And then Balaam went on his way, as did Balak. I found this fascinating for so many reasons. There are only two talking animals in the Bible, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but the first, of course, in the Garden of Eden, and this, the second, this donkey who seems to allude to the donkey on which Jesus rode into Jerusalem humbly, and not on a great horse with a sword, as many had expected. So foreshadowing the Messiah in the beginning of this account with the donkey is clearly confirmed in Balaam's third pronouncement, as he prophesied the star that shall come out of Jacob. Now Balaam's eyes were opened by God in order to see the angel of the Lord. He was a spiritual man, and in communication with gods, it was his job, essentially. But this reminds us that Satan can disguise himself, and this is why we need to have a relationship with God and to study his word so we're not easily deceived by false prophets. Because even false prophets can be accurate sometimes, and they can clearly communicate with gods. Balaam's experience is a clear example of this. Now, Balaam will later be killed by the Israelites as God avenged the children of Israel. In 31.16, Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. In Joshua 13.22, we see Balaam referenced as a soothsayer. Balaam, also the son of Beor, the soothsayer, did the children of Israel slay with the sword among them that were slain by them. Soothsayer, Kassam, is explained as someone that determines by lot or magical scroll. It's a diviner, just as they cast lots for Jesus' clothes. This would be a current day tarot reader or tea leaf reader, perhaps. In Luke 16, 13, we are told you can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and money or mammon, as it's referred to in this verse. And that's exactly what Bilam was doing. He was trying to serve two masters, making money off of his divining.
We see this in many different circumstances today as financial scandals arise or as the net worth of certain pastors is discovered. So the spirit of Balaam is actually alive and well in today's church. Balaam's experience reminds us that God gives us free will, and he is long-suffering, but he often tries to help, even though we may see it as something in the way. How many times have we fought for things in our lives when nothing but obstacles were put in our way? How many times have we been Balaam in that way, trying to be crafty and negotiate our own way? And how many times have we been the donkey, seeing danger that someone else couldn't, and trying to help them, trying to get in their way of making a bad decision? As we know, that help is not always received with open arms. God gave Balaam many opportunities to see the truth to do right, but in the end, Balaam couldn't do that. So much so, in fact, we even find him in the book of Revelation. In the letter to Pergamos, Jesus says, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak, the king of Moab, to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. The stumbling block Jesus is mentioning is scandalon, and it means a a trap stick, a bent sapling, a snare. This is quite egregious in God's eyes to create a trap for the Israelites, and Balaam is killed for it. This story also tells us that No one changes what God has chosen. Balaam could not curse what God had blessed, Israel. And that covenant God made with Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob was one that would not be broken. And this covenant is now available to everyone through Jesus and his sacrifice. God is not a man, Balaam had said, and so he does not lie. God's covenant is true and unchanging in this way. I hope you enjoyed this story. I enjoyed reading this so much. I got so much from it. And I will look forward to any comments you have or things that I left out or got incorrect. I would love to hear your feedback. Until next time.